and you. May I begin by, uh, in fact, acknowledging uh, the great work that I think has been done by the Develop Development Policy Centre and the Asia Foundation in putting this conference together. It's good to see so much interest in international uh, and uh, international aid and development uh, and so much new research being done in this uh, really important field. It's my great pleasure this morning to welcome the Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, to deliver the opening address uh, for this 2014 Australasian Aid and International Development Policy Workshop. We're delighted that the Minister has agreed to join us today. There could be uh, no more fitting way to start a conference on international aid and development than to have it opened by the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Ms Bishop came and spoke, I think, in this uh, very lecture theatre in June of 2012 on the topic of aid in the Pacific when she was Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, anyone who was here that day or has read the speech will know that she's been true to her word and is now putting into place many of the reforms that she sh foreshadowed back at that time. The Minister has already demonstrated her commitment to deepening Australia's engagement with Asia and the Pacific, including through the new Colombo plan, which she is championing. And indeed, I can say that ANU is one of the institutions that it is, in, is embracing uh, with some glee. This conference also has a strong focus on Asia, not only as an aid recipient, but also an increasingly important aid donor. With speakers uh, on this subject here today from China, India, Korea and Thailand, uh, amongst a number of others. Finally, I would like to mention that the Minister has just come back from her first trip to Papua New Guinea as Foreign Minister, where she announced the $3 million of funding over three years uh, for the Australian, from the Australian Aid Program to establish the Papua New Guinea Family and Sexual Violence Case Management Centre, another program that ANU is heavily involved with. Minister, thank you for your leadership on these very important issues. We appreciate that the role of Foreign Minister is, I think, probably one of the busiest uh, you certainly find in government and indeed, I think, uh, in Australia today. Uh, and so we're very grateful that you've made time in what is a very visual schedule uh, to join us here this morning uh, to open this conference. The Minister has agreed, I understand, to speak for about 20 minutes or so uh, and then to take a few questions. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming the Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. Um, Vice-Chancellor Ian Young, thank you for that welcome. Professor Stephen Howes, our esteemed guests, Their Excellency, the Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really pleased to be at this workshop because I hope that we all share the same goals. We want to find ways to make Australia's aid program work more effectively to help to improve people's lives. We want to find the very best ways to alleviate poverty and improve economic outcomes and build stability and prosperity, particularly in our region, the Indian Ocean, the Asia Pacific. I want to thank the Crawford School for organising this conference and creating a forum for sharing and collaborating. And I thank also the Harold Mitchell Foundation for donating the um, funding for the policy research and partnering in that $3 million case management centre for victims of family and sexual violence that I announced last week when I was in Ley in Papua New Guinea. To the conference participants, your research gives us insights on the changing landscape of development assistance. And there is no doubt that it is changing. Um, I take issue with those who focus on quantity, not quality. There are many examples in domestic policies where billions of dollars have been poured into programs only to find that standards have gone backwards. So what we need to do is focus on new ways of achieving better outcomes in the area of overseas development assistance and aid. There are new and emerging donors on the landscape. They're increasingly important. The private sector is a major driver of growth and it's a powerful contributor to development programs. Official development assistance now provides a relatively small share of total finance for development. 
Building sustainable and inclusive communities and economies is the key to alleviating poverty and increasing living standards. It's being called the new aid paradigm. And our aid program can succeed in this new paradigm because when we get it right, we can make a real difference. And we can do this by focusing on our region. Now, we haven't always got it right. I find it utterly distressing to continue to see aid programs in Papua New Guinea, for example, that are not having the desired outcome. I find it distressing to know that despite the fact that Australia invests about half a billion dollars each and every year into Papua New Guinea, it will not meet one of its Millennium Development Goals. In fact, it is going backwards. It is not on track to meet one of the seven Millennium Development Goals. But I'm not just focusing on PNG. This is an issue across our region. So we need a more effective and efficient aid program. We need an aid program that has a strong culture of accountability and performance. And the new government is committed to a new strategic direction for Australia's aid program. It will enhance the work we are already doing it in the region and it will focus on the region. So let me be clear from the outset. It is in Australia's national interest to deliver a responsible, affordable and sustainable aid program, a program that will promote economic growth and reduce poverty. Now, we've had to make some pretty tough decisions this year. We inherited a deteriorating budget from the previous government, cumulative deficits of $123 billion. Now, that means, ladies and gentlemen, that $123 billion more than came in in revenue has been spent. The previous government was on a trajectory for government debt to reach $667 billion. So the government was borrowing from overseas to pay our bills and our aid program. Borrow overseas, send overseas. So we have to get our budget under control. And this means that the aid program, like every other government program, had to be put on a sustainable footing. So our domestic budget outlook meant that I had little choice but to reduce this year's aid budget. And I did so by reducing it by about $100 million over last year. That means that tough decisions had to be made, but we are still one of the most generous donor countries in the world. We remain among the world's top 10 despite being the 12th largest economy and just 53rd in the world for population. So per capita, we are still among the world's top donors. But what I've done is stabilise the aid budget at $5 billion per annum. It will increase in line with inflation. So it will go up by CPI. This will provide certainty, predictability of funding for our partners, for the recipients, and it will put the aid budget on a sustainable financial footing. You see, what was happening in the past is that announcements were being made about aid funding to meet certain targets or to appease certain groups. And then when the cameras moved on and the media went home, money was being removed from the forward estimates. In the last 15 months of the previous government, $5.7 billion was removed from the aid budget forward estimates. So what certainty, what predictability did that give to recipient countries and our partners? It created the impression that Australia was an unreliable aid partner. So we intend to be reliable, consistent and far more strategic. We're refocusing our efforts,
placing our aid program more clearly in the context of Australia's national interests. And that is why the aid program is now part of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. We have integrated the separate aid agency, AusAid, into the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. We have created a single department with responsibility for advancing Australia's interests in the diplomatic, trade and development context. Now, it is in Australia's national interests for there to be peace and prosperity in our region. That is part of our national interest. So that's why we're consolidating our efforts on our neighbourhood, the Indian Ocean, the Asia Pacific, where we can make the biggest difference. This is where we have a responsibility to foster peace and prosperity. Now, I know from a report on the ABC last night that apparently my priorities are wrong because I'm not funding the reconstruction of the Granada Parliament House in the Caribbean. Now, according to the ABC, I've got my priorities wrong. The previous government, in order to buy the vote of the Grenadian government for the Security Council seat, and believe me, I support us being on the Security Council, promised to rebuild their Parliament House and committed $3.5 million to do it. A million dollars has already gone. The Grenadian government campaigned at the last election on the basis that they would not put a dollar into the building of their Parliament House because the Australian government and others will do it. Well, I'm sorry. Grenada is amongst the high development countries in the world. In fact, I had to have a look on the Human Development Index. Grenada's up there in the High Human Development Index, in the Low Human Development Index, way down at number 156 is Papua New Guinea, or Fiji, or Tuvalu, or the Solomon Islands, or Timor-Leste, or Vanuatu. That's where our aid dollars must be directed. And that's where they will be directed. It doesn't mean that we will walk away from humanitarian efforts. It doesn't mean that we don't have global responsibilities. It doesn't mean that we will take money away from multilateral organisations that have a much broader sweep. But when it comes to our direct aid support, the focus must be on our region. Now, we are going to be promoting economic growth. Aid is not a panacea to poverty. Millions of people have been lifted out of poverty by economic growth, which creates jobs and which improves standards of living. You only have to look at countries like China and the Asian tiger economies to know that this is true. In 1990, about 55% of people in the Asia Pacific lived in extreme poverty. It's now less than 22%, but I can tell you that's not because of the aid budgets. That's because economies have been opened up to trade and investment. Aid for trade will be fundamental to our policy approach. For every single dollar invested in aid for trade, an estimated $8 in additional exports are created from developing countries. Now, that's a good return on aid investment. So the program will have a much stronger focus on promoting economic growth than it has in past years. This means using more of our aid to create jobs and build skills and invest in productivity, enhancing infrastructure and expanding trade in our region. And we'll work with partner governments to build the critical institutions and the policies that they need to facilitate trade and promote functioning economies. And this is all part of what I call economic diplomacy. Just as traditional diplomacy aims to achieve peace, economic diplomacy aims to achieve prosperity. Now, prioritising economic growth doesn't mean a lesser focus on human development or poverty reduction. They're the two sides of the same coin. We will invest in better quality education, enabling young people to get the skills they need to contribute to the economy. We recognise that one of the best ways to promote economic growth in our region is to empower women and girls. And that's why we have appointed former Senator Natasha Stott Despoyer as our ambassador for women and girls. And her role will be to visit our region, to represent Australia in regional and global fora, to promote the empowerment of women and girls. When women are able to actively participate in the economy, uh, the, former, the formal labour markets, 
then everyone prospers. So we're going to support women starting businesses, building their schools, um, stepping up to leadership roles. I had a wonderful meeting in Fort Moresby with about 20 women who were in leadership roles in the private sector, in the public sector, in the law and justice sector, and they were talking about the obstacles to peace and prosperity in Papua New Guinea, our closest neighbour. And they come down to some fundamental issues. But at the end of the day, we have to be there to support the women. And that means supporting the girls as well. We'll invest in health, particularly health systems, so that men and women and children can access basic, basic health services and lead healthier, more productive lives. I made it clear to the PNG government that we will move away from direct service delivery because that's the responsibility of a mature, sovereign government. Australia should not still be providing textbooks for classrooms. We should not still be providing basic drugs for health centres. That is the responsibility of the sovereign government. But we'll be there to help with the policies that will enable that to happen. We are committed to playing a strong role in responding to disease threats in the region. Uh, malaria, TB, HIV, AIDS, which can create huge economic burdens for developing countries. We're also working with governments in our region to ensure growth, uh, growth is inclusive of the poorest and the most disadvantaged, making sure particular consideration is given to including people with disabilities, those living in remote rural communities and ethnic minorities. And as I said, we'll continue our humanitarian work across the globe. I think Australia will continue to be one of the most effective and responsive humanitarian donors, certainly in our region. And we've demonstrated this in recent times in our response to natural disasters in the Philippines, Tonga and Vanuatu. In fact, I visited the Philippines just after the impact of Typhoon Haiyan and went to Tacloban and saw the impact of our immediate response. We had a field hospital on the tarmac at the airport in Tacloban within days, uh, treating people who had been so severely injured by the impact of the typhoon. We provided $40 million in financial assistance, in money, but our contribution went much further than that. We had 550 military personnel on the ground in the Philippines. We had aircraft, C-130s. We had HMAS Tobruk there to bring supplies and enable the aid workers to travel around the Philippines. And you know what? None of that counted in the assessment of our aid contribution to the Philippines. And this is something else we're going to change. When other countries include in their aid program assessment the amount of, say, military or private sector funding, and Australia doesn't. We only count the actual dollars we provide. We're comparing apples with oranges. I was surprised to find that Australia was listed as the third largest donor to the Philippines typhoon effort, given that there was $40 million, 550 personnel, ships, planes. And I thought, gee, other countries must have done an extraordinary job. But when I looked at their contribution, it was their military contribution. Well, if I'd added Australia's military contribution, we would have been by far the largest donor. Now, this isn't a question of who's the largest donor, but let's compare apples with oranges before people start criticising the Australian government for not responding. Have a look at what we've actually provided and compare it with those donors who are said to be number one and two, and their contribution was their military contribution. Fantastic. But let's compare like with like. The private sector is already involved in development assistance. And I want the Australian government to work more effectively with the private sector, recognising that private enterprise is the engine of growth. So we're going to explore innovative models for private sector partnerships for development, uh, moving away from the old way of doing things, the more traditional aid program approaches. Uh, one example is the $20 million that Australia is contributing to the Philippines Public-Private Partnership Centre. Now, our aid dollar is helping prepare 
tender and award 26 public-private partnership infrastructure projects that are valued about $7 billion. So the work will now inform a similar pilot scheme in Indonesia as part of a project to tackle infrastructure shortfalls in the APEC region. And this is, this is what I mean by economic diplomacy, that I put at the heart of Australia's interactions with the world. For Australian companies, there will be opportunities to design and build bridges and railways and schools and ports. That's a significant economic opportunity, but we encourage them to, of course, partner with local companies. It's been estimated that about $8 trillion worth of infrastructure is needed in the APEC region alone by 2020. So we are funding such infrastructure, like the uh, Khao Lan Bridge in Vietnam, that's going to transform local economies. It, it will enable people to travel more easily, to access education, employment and markets for their trade. We're supporting programs like the Pacific Business Fund that I recently launched in the Solomon Islands to foster business growth in developing countries. The fund will be managed by the Asian Development Bank. It will deliver capital and importantly, advice and mentorship to local businesses who are seeking to export and expand. Our contribution of $15 million will allow the fund to work with at least 100 high potential companies to expand and diversify their operations, leverage $15 million in finance from commercial institutions, and ultimately it's been estimated will create up to 1,000 jobs. I've had discussions about this new aid paradigm and the involvement of the private sector across the globe in recent time. I attended a roundtable in Washington where aid agencies from USAID to um, analysts to some of the bigger NGOs were discussing ways to leverage the private sector, harness the private sector so that we can get better outcomes. Indeed, I had a long conversation with the United Kingdom's International Development Secretary Justine Greening, and she brings a wealth of experience from the private sector into development policy in this country. So we're sharing experiences with partner countries as we seek to create new ways and innovative solutions to long-standing development challenges. It's not good enough to do what we've always done and have the same outcomes. A great example in our region is our partnership with Carnival Cruises to provide increased economic op opportunities through the tourism industry. I mean, the Pacific is a magnificent tourism magnet. And cruising is big business. Carnival brings over a quarter of a million tourists to the Pacific each year. But we need to link local industries to Carnival. And that's what we're doing through this partnership to increase local earnings. So Carnival, for example, has agreed to source uh, the bottled water from a Vanuatan supplier and is in discussions to source local coffee. Now, this might seem obvious to you, but it wasn't happening. So the opportunities are going to spread, spread much further than just direct sales. Taxi drivers and coffee shops and local tourism operators and fruit and vegetable growers and the local <coughs> markets all have the potential to benefit when connected to the tourism supply chain. And that's what we need to do to get local businesses into regional and global supply chains. And Carnival is also working to hire uh, Ni Vanuatu crew. So with over 100 ships visiting the Pacific annually and up to 200 crew on board each ship, the potential for job opportunities is huge. I'm really impressed with the change in thinking of a number of multilateral organisations. Uh, the Garvey Alliance, for example. Its international finance facility for immunisation is using capital markets to create new funding for its work. The finance facility uses donor funds as collateral to issue bonds on the capital market. These bonds generate funds that are then used to finance crucial immunisation programs. And that's the kind of thinking we need. Um, get away from the old models of government handouts, because ultimately our overseas aid is an investment in our region, an investment in the people, an investment in their future, and we expect solid returns from that investment. The independent review of aid effectiveness of April 2011 made a couple of very salient points and it noted the incredible trajectory of aid funding in the previous government's budgets. It described 
the trajectory as steep and challenging. Quote, it makes sense that budget appropriations each year be contingent on things going to plan and existing monies being spent effectively. Failure to achieve a hurdle or to fully achieve it must have consequences. For example, the government could reduce the rate of increase or withhold all or part of the funding unless and until the hurdle is achieved. And one of the recommendations was to put in place hurdles. That has not been done. So that's why the Australian government is now instituting new quality assurance measures to make sure that our aid program is accountable and is delivering value for money. We want to deliver more effectively to those most in need. But we're not going to impose a set of unreasonable standards on partner governments or NGOs and others working in international development. We want to have a consultative and collaborative process. Um, my colleague, the Parliamentary Secretary for Foreign Affairs, Brett Mason, has been leading the consultations on the setting of these benchmarks. We've done extensive consultations with NGOs, the private sector, uh, academics, including the Development Policy Centre here at the ANU, a range of partner governments, um, how we can improve the aid program and how we can measure it. We'll draw on the expertise of our development partners and key multilateral organisations. In fact, I had a meeting with the World Bank. They're going through precisely the same process with their aid programs on how to measure them, how to analyse them, how to benchmark them and how to deliver better value for money. We've posted a discussion paper on the DFAT website. We've invited submissions to feed into the consultation process. And I certainly welcome submissions and input from all of you here today with expertise in this area. This is a collaborative process. We want the aid sector to be closely involved. I'm agnostic about how aid is delivered. I want to see the best forms of delivery by the best organisations equipped to do it. So while we are in the process of finalising our benchmarks, I'll share my thinking on some of the broad parameters. We'll be assessing performance across all levels of the aid program. At the strategic level, we'll assess the entire aid program's progress against key goals and priorities, a small number of high-level targets. We'll use performance benchmarks at the level of individual programs to assess the relative effectiveness of our portfolio of investments. And these assessments will determine how the aid budget is allocated. Then at an individual level, at an individual assessment level, will ensure funding is directed to those programs, those investments that are making the most difference, and that poor performing projects or poor performing deliverers are either improved or the funds are redirected. We'll also review the way we assess the performance of our delivery partners, uh, multilateral organisations, NGOs and contractors, to ensure that there's a stronger link between performance and funding. And I'm really pleased to report that the initial consultations indicate there's been broad agreement uh, among our partners across the sector with this approach. We'll also be working with partner governments to ensure the millions of dollars spent each year on country programs are used responsibly in those countries and effectively. And that's why we're looking to introduce mutual obligations between ourselves and our partner countries so that both parties are held accountable for outcomes. I've mentioned Papua New Guinea. It's a country that I have very deep affection for. Um, it's a vital partner to Australia in the region. But PNG is a good example of how our relationship is maturing from the aid donor, aid recipient, through to a much more sophisticated economic partnership. And our aid program should reflect that. So we're currently undertaking a review of the Papua New Guinea aid program in conjunction with the PNG government to reflect that change. Both our governments recognise that aid investments need to target areas where Australian expertise can have a real impact on sustainable and inclusive economic growth. A more prosperous Papua New Guinea will improve the quality of life for its own people and have economic and security benefits for the whole region. So again, this is an example of aligning Australia's foreign policy interests with our development assistance goals. So our aid program needs to respond to a rapidly changing international environment. Over a billion people have been lifted out of, out of extreme poverty in the last 20 years. And it's a number of key countries in our region, including Indonesia and Sri Lanka and Vietnam, that have experienced strong economic growth with ODA now representing a tiny fraction of their GDP. 
But over the years ahead, our aid dollar will continue to shrink relative to domestic budgets in our partner countries in Asia, and that's how it should be. We should be seeking to do ourselves out of a job. At the same time, many of our neighbours in the Pacific do remain fragile. There has been stagnating growth, and there are very unclear long-term prospects. But some countries that used to receive aid are now becoming major donors. Many traditional Western donors are scaling back and new donors are emerging. So the donor landscape has shifted and these are facts that we can't ignore. They're also the driving factors behind this new aid paradigm. So Australia has to be more strategic to be effective. Take China for example. China's aid budget is now around the same size as Australia's. We should be engaging with China, not only as a growing presence in our region, but do what we can to capitalise on our respective strengths and bring our combined weight to bear in addressing some of the development challenges of the Pacific. So through a development cooperation partnership with China, we're taking the first steps towards working together in important areas like health and water management. For example, we've got this trilateral cooperation arrangement with Australia, China and PNG. We're going to draw together the different strengths of the countries. Australia is a trusted and effective donor. China is a newly developed economy. And PNG, whose economy is going through a transition. And we've begun a collaboration to target malaria in PNG. Australia and China have technical expertise to offer PNG in combating the disease and the region of course in the long run will benefit if we can continue to control malaria. So this is a positive concrete example of China's active engagement in international development and Australia's responsiveness to the realities of the global economy. So it's my hope that we can continue to engage with our traditional donors, with the emerging donors in programs that really make a difference. So for those of you who work in international development, we can see the hardship, the despair, the poverty, and despite our best efforts, too many nations will fail to meet the Millennium Development Goals. But I do remain optimistic because I do know that Australia's work overseas does change lives. But I'm sure we can do better and that we can make a much bigger difference. We remain committed to our overseas aid program, but we want to see value for money. Effectiveness is the watchword. And we will support the organisations and those who can deliver genuine success. And we will focus where we can have the biggest impact in our region. Aid is a powerful tool in our statecraft. It's ultimately designed to protect and project Australia's broader interests. And that is to ensure greater prosperity, sustainable growth, and opportunities to lift the standards of, of everybody in our region. This is how we're going to make a significant impact in the Indian Ocean, Asia Pacific. And I hope that you will join with the Australian government on this journey. Thank you. Minister, uh, it's Kobe Maglin from Oxfam Australia. Uh, thank you very much for your comments and certainly Oxfam appreciates the opportunity to uh, be involved in the benchmark consultations. Uh, we also welcome the approach um, and focus on poverty reduction. I'm interested as well, uh, there's increasing inequality in the region. Um, I'm, I'd be interested in the Minister's comments around the role of aid in addressing inequality given that economic justice Sorry, economic growth won't necessarily uh, address inequality. Economic growth is utterly essential to addressing inequality because we want, you know, the saying, um, the rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, we want to see the economies in our region reach their potential, uh, which means providing opportunities for people to engage in economic activity, to have jobs, to uh, create support for their families, their communities. And 
It doesn't mean we're walking away from humanitarian issues or programs that alleviate poverty, but the focus has to be on sustainable communities through economic growth. There's no getting away from it. And that's why we are so keen to ensure that countries like PNG that are going through an economic transition as they're getting enormous amounts of foreign capital to develop some major projects, resource projects, the LNG project, for example, we'll see billions of dollars come into PNG. We have to ensure that the government of Papua New Guinea fulfills its obligation to its citizens, which is to ensure that they can all share in that wealth. Hence, we're supporting the creation of a sovereign wealth fund in Papua New Guinea, so that the Papua New Guinea government is able to provide the services and deliver the programs that support all their people. It's not the role of the Australian government to replace the sovereign government of Papua New Guinea, but we certainly can share our experience and our expertise to ensure that they can fulfil their obligations to their people, and that includes addressing issues of inequality. I spend a lot of time focusing on PNG. It's the only nation that's been a colony of Australia. Uh, we have a responsibility. We have historic ties. They're our closest neighbour. We have a deep affection for each other. But we have to be honest with each other about how PNG can fulfil its fundamental responsibilities to its own people. And that's what we're seeking to do with this refocusing of the aid budget to support economic growth which will support the reduction of inequality amongst citizens. Yes, up here. Hello, my name is Ronnie Mullen. I'm an American academic working on Indian foreign aid, researching Indian foreign aid. And my question is about linking performance and funding, because what you often see, for example, in India, is that the poorest performers subnationally, states like Bihar and India, uh, are also the ones that need funding the most. Poorest performers in terms of, uh, or Uttar Pradesh, in terms of economic growth, uh, uh, lowest in human development indicators. Um, so channeling money to those who are doing better um, which is uh, uh, what you would want to do in terms of better outcomes um, is, is somewhat difficult when you have poverty reduction also as one of your ma main aims. So I'm just wondering how you all uh, square that. Thanks. We're, we're targeting the performance of uh, aid delivery. So the performance of organisations that deliver aid, they can be assessed, they should be subject to um, an assessment. And where we've been putting money into a particular program and that program is not having the desired impact, you can't, don't keep putting money into a program that's not having an effect. You rework it, you redesign it, you do it differently. If there's um, corruption involved, you take the money away. But you don't keep putting money into a program that's failing. You think about it differently. You reassess it. You redesign it. And that's why we've got to be much more flexible and creative and innovative in our thinking about aid. I mean, the new aid paradigm is not just a phrase I thought of. This is what's happening around the world. People are recognising. We set ourselves these targets, 2015 for the Millennium Development Goals, and then all the countries that we're directing the money to are going backwards and we go, oh, OK, well, let's set another target. No, stop and think about what we're doing and why it is not working and where it is working. Replicate that. Scale that up. Have pilot programs to see what works. And then if it works, then start scaling it up elsewhere. Can it work in other places? I'm very optimistic that we can really make a significant difference. We're not about punishing underperformance because of factors outside a country or an organisation's control, but what we're doing is thinking differently about the outcomes that we all want and how to achieve them. Just one, more? one final question. Oh, no, this one down. You've been really mean to this side of the room. <laughs> uh, do we, we'll have to take one from over here. 
Hello, Minister. I'm Belinda Thompson here at ANU as a PhD student. Um, I was interested in your comments where you were reflecting on the growing number of stakeholders and potential partners and actors in this space. Can you um, just give us a few comments looking at uh, where you see not-for-profits sitting in this and particularly some of the smaller not-for-profits who might not have the profile or the scale of an MSF or an Oxfam but are either local actors or who are maybe international actors but just a small footprint? Well, NGOs are utterly essential to the delivery of um, overseas development assistance. They're at the core of it. Uh, but they also need to recognise this changing landscape, and I know they do, that the private sector is there to partner with, not to, not to compete, but to partner. Um, I meet with the largest NGOs in the world. Um, Sir Farsley Ahmed yesterday came to see me. And uh, he, since the 1970s, he's been doing extraordinary work in Bangladesh and now far beyond. Um, so, the largest NGO in the world is recognising that they need to change the way they are delivering aid and they need to be accountable for what they do and the outcomes. I said I was agnostic about the way aid deliver is delivered. That means that if um, the smallest NGO is able to make a difference that is effective, we'll support it. So, um, I'm not focusing on the big names or uh, those who have always done the same work, will assess each partner organisation, will assess each NGO and see what they can do for their particular constituency. So NGOs are vital and will always be there while ever we are having to deliver aid into our region. But I think it's the way they leverage their work and their funding that will really make the difference. Let me pick one bias. Yeah. From where I was standing, it was a left-hand bias, so I was just going... <laughs> I was just wanting to go over to the right. Now, that was a joke, seriously. <laughs> uh, thank you for providing balance. Um, and also for your insights, um, they're appreciated. Uh, my name's Andrew Rowe from a... Uh, where were you from, sorry? Uh, from a firm called Sustino. We provide services to uh, the development aid sector. And it's good to see that you're recognising the role of the private sector and what we can do and the contribution we can make. Um, but I'd make the comment that SME is the engine room of any economy. Um, but do you see that this increased participation by the private sector is to come from the large uh, multinational corporations that have traditionally dominated um, providing those services uh, and almost been preferred? Or do you see the importance of nurturing SMEs, which are the hotbed of innovation and um, progress? Um, in, within the aid sector, um, both in Australia and in developing countries, um, and um, nurturing that sector rather than preferring the, the, the larger multinational firms. In Parliament, we call that a Dorothy Dixer. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, we recognise the small to medium enterprises and the role that they play. Uh, the large corporations, let's take the major mining and resource companies that are... Um, conducting businesses in our region. They are playing a significant role as good corporate citizens in providing healthcare, education, um, a whole range of services that might otherwise be provided by a functioning sovereign government. But in exchange for um, the privilege of working in those countries, they're providing support for the local communities, and that's important. Some of the work that I've seen done, again, in PNG, by Oil Search and ExxonMobil is a fantastic examples of service delivery in these areas. But in the area of um, economic growth and stimulating opportunities, SMEs have an enormous role to play. I have spent some time with the um, good folk at the Institute, Institute for International Trade at um, another university in South Australia. I shouldn't mention it, should I, here? No. Anyway, there's another university that's doing this. And uh, they are focusing on providing opportunities for SMEs to work in the aid area. And there are some magnificent examples where uh, small businesses in Australia have connected with um, communities in the Pacific and created an opportunity to invest in a supply chain. So SMEs are the hotbed of innovation and creativity 
and have a significant role to play. Um, we need to harness their capability and their capacity. That's why our focus, as I say, our focus is on aid for trade. That's where SMEs come into the, into the picture. And um, through the outreach, the consultations that we're undertaking, we are looking for innovative ideas. In fact, I'm discussing with the department now um, a way of recognising innovation, a way of providing um, funding for innovative ideas to be scaled up. Uh, the UK and the US have got uh, this terrific fund, and I'm just about to think of its name, DIV, the Development Innovation Ventures, and they provide funding for essentially a competition of innovative ideas to come forward. They pilot those ideas and then they scale them up if they're shown to work. And I think in recent times it's about 50 or 60 projects, pilots, have been funded by the UK-US partnership, uh, which, are, which can be anything from a, a small business in a particular region to a, um, a larger enterprise somewhere else that employs more people. But it's all about getting ep economic growth going in places that would otherwise require a significant development assistance. And I've been talking to the US and the UK about how we can partner with them or indeed set up our own way of doing this. So innovation um, should be encouraged, rewarded and scaled up where it's been shown to work.